This is Michael Moore, and this is Rumble. My guest today, Raul Peck. He's a director, screenwriter, producer. He was born in Haiti and has lived in the Congo, the United States, France, Germany. He is, in, in a sense, I don't mind, I hope he doesn't mind me saying this, a brother in arms, uh, because I... For years, for decades, I've looked for documentaries that that um, where I would feel, well, if, you know, there's somebody that we're on the that we're on the same page, so to speak, and that we see the world maybe in a similar way, and that is to me, Raul Peck. He also makes uh, scripted films, uh, The Man by the Shore, uh, Lumumba, Sometimes in April, and of course, The Young. Karl Marx, which you have to see. Uh, this nobody's made a film. I, actually, I don't even know if I've ever seen like a Hollywood type movie made just on Karl Marx. But but if to, if you want to see a movie that uh, portrays the early years, how did he become Karl Marx? Raoul has made this film. Uh, his documentaries, though, include Haiti, The Silence of the Dogs, The Prophet, and Nothing But. And his 2016 masterpiece, I Am Not Your Negro, which won the BAFTA Award in the UK and was nominated for an Oscar here in uh, the US. Uh, You all have uh, heard me talk about I Am Not Your Negro uh, many times on this podcast. Uh, I've I've asked in a in a polite way that it be required viewing for all listeners of this podcast. Uh, And then, as you know, a few months ago. Um, I made a deal uh, so that uh, those of you who listen to this podcast could just click and watch I Am Not Your Negro right now. And tens of thousands of you did that. And um, it was very powerful. And the feedback from all of you who had, you know, this film had not come to your town or you'd missed it on C- on PBS, whatever. It's You agreed with me <laughs> that this is one of the great documentaries ever made. And, um, and so, you know, if you if you haven't, if you don't know what we're talking about, I am not your Negro, Raul Peck uses a sort of an unfinished manuscript. It was actually, I think what, what Baldwin had written to his agent about the next, uh, book that he wanted to write. And then it was not finished and, and he passed away. So Raul Peck, uh, got permission from Baldwin's family to use his final writings to create a film. They would end up not necessarily being a book, but they would be a film called I Am Not Your Negro, which was is a line from Baldwin. And then Raul hired Samuel L. Jackson to be the voice of James Baldwin. Five minutes into the film, you're not thinking that Samuel L. Jackson. It does what you hope every great film does. It completely takes you out of the so-called reality that we're in and, and transports us to a different place. And you believe for the next 90 minutes you are listening to James Baldwin. James Baldwin is in the room with you. And it's, it's uh, again, so if you haven't seen it, my friends, please, uh, it's easy to find. You can find it on the, the PBS On Demand. You can, uh, you can get it on iTunes. You can get it, uh, just type in I Am Not Your Negro and uh, uh, you'll have four or five choices of how you can see this film. And teachers, uh, uh, you will instantly be thinking, how soon can I show this to my students? Um, so that's that. But uh, Raul is here today, uh, not to discuss uh, that film, though I'm, I would be happy to talk about it more. Uh, but I, my friends, he has outdone himself here in 2021 with a radical and powerful, almost four-hour-long documentary. I know, right? Don't, 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 don't worry. It's You watch it in four parts. It's like four chapters, and each of them are around an hour long each of them are their are their own piece and yet they are part of the greater whole of a documentary entitled exterminate all the brutes exterminate all the brutes it's a line from joseph conrad's heart of darkness we'll talk about that a bit um it's on hbo right now it's on hbo max it's on hbo on demand i think for a little a while longer so either of those hbo's you can find it. If you don't have HBO, I'll, I'll ask Raul where else uh, you can 
watch exterminate all the brutes. Raul has taken on the monumental task of exploring what he describes as the three key words that summarize the history of humanity, civilization, colonization, and extermination. And again, I, I don't want to sound like a teacher here again, but saying this is a required viewing, but my friends, I can't ask you enough if, if, if you have time, especially on this holiday weekend, to watch Exterminate All the Brutes on HBO if you have access to that. Because, because here's why. And we are ending, you know, this is the week here, we're ending of the first year anniversary of the murder of George Floyd. So fortunately, this is still, this conversation is still on our minds a lot. But when every time that, you know, you hear, I hear somebody say, well, you know, it's time for a national conversation on race. Uh, or we need to come together and heal. Or any of the other usual flim flam that we hear on the news by the pundits. Well, my friends, <laughs> for me, that national conversation should start with all of us screening Exterminate All the Brutes. Yes, uh, this series, this documentary, this four-part documentary is that important. So please welcome to Rumble from Paris, France tonight, Raoul Peck. Raoul, thank you so much for coming on Rumble. Well, my pleasure, Michael. It's It's been a long time since we talked last time. Yes, and, too long. And thank you for those, these nice words. And, and I should return the compliments to you, too. Because not not until I've earned it, but thank you for well, saying that. Well, you've earned much of it already, by the way, well, my friend. Well, thank, thank you for that. But I, I um, as I was telling you just before we went on, that, that uh, um, when I watch your films, I personally feel that less alone in the world and um and it's such a gift uh these movies that you have made and you've been making them for quite some time now but these last two that people currently especially younger people might be familiar with uh, i am not your negro and now exterminate all the brutes you go from you know essentially using james baldwin's words his story his worldview to in this film these are your words the, this is essentially your story or a greater story of humanity that you're telling, but through your lens, your words, your voice, and we hear you. Well, it, it, it's a mixture, if I may interrupt, because I, I did that work on the shoulder of three great historian and scholar, uh, one being Roxanne Domba, artist. Uh, the other is uh, Sven Linquist, of course, who wrote that wonderful book. Uh, who, and use the title Exterminate All the Brutes. And the third one being Michel Rolf Trouillot, who is a Haitian American scholar who uh, wrote an incredible book as well uh, with the title Silencing the Past, uh, which is the, the story of how his, history have uh, muted uh, the incredible Haitian uh, uh, revolution who basically stopped slavery on the uh, American continent. And so out of that, of course, uh, I had to bring my own story in it. I didn't want to do a didactic film and I had to, uh, uh, you know, use those three major books and, and swallow them and make them mine and then make a film that would be totally and without any uh, uh, um, uh, censorship of myself, self-censorship, to tell the whole story from my point of view, and uh, and hold no punch, you know. But because for me it had to be the definitive story or deconstruction of Eurocentric narrative. Well, you do you pull no punch, and I know how hard this is, and it must have been hard for you because you knew as you were showing different scenes and saying different things you say in this film that this is going to be uncomfortable viewing for a lot of people. And when I tell people that this film is, is sort of like, if you'd like sort of the DNA of white supremacy, um, he doesn't just take it back to the beginning of uh, this country in 1776. And he doesn't just take it back to, to 1492. Uh, uh, he goes back as far as from what I can remember now as the Crusades, a thousand uh, years ago, this 
thought poem, essentially, this four-hour thought poem, this essay um, weaves in and out from, from the past to the present. And I've never seen this idea presented in this manner. And while, Raul, you bring up people who are not white that commit these acts of awful violence and this and that or whatever, but there is no false equivalency here. This is an examination of white European uh, behavior for a thousand years. And the fact that we would end up on a street corner in Minneapolis, Minnesota, from your the scenes from the Crusades, it's just so it's so powerful. And I'm just you must have thought while you were making this, oh Jesus is gonna upset some people. And by some people that's a euphemism for white people. Yeah. So Well, you can't really uh, uh think like this because you know the film is is personal, but it is also somehow uh, my own story, and and I feel I've been living all my life with that story inside mm. me. It's it's the it's the story of your daily life, basically. So at one point, you know, you can't just continue to stay polite. You can't continue to try to explain. You can't continue to hope that somebody will listen. Uh, what have been so obvious for many centuries. And, and I just uh, knew that uh, there was no way that I could, uh, you know, for me, it was not about what people will say. You know, the question, uh, as you know, Michael, in this industry, uh, the question was, uh, where will I be able to make it? And will I have the freedom I need to tell that story? without any censorship. Yeah, but yes, because as I'm watching it, I'm thinking, how did he get this made? How did he get the money for this? How is this? And HBO, I mean, I would say as a more liberal-minded network, I mean, they will have a lot of things that you can't see in other networks. And yet, I'm thinking, how did he even get this on HBO? And then, at some point near the end of the film, you just say it out loud that you realize, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of quoting you here, that it's almost a miracle that this film is even being made. Uh, explain that to people who are listening well, to this. Well, not soon. almost. It, it's a total miracle. Because yeah, I, I, saw, I pulled the punch on that. I'm sorry. <laughs> it is that. And, and by the way, a week ago today on my podcast, I asked every, all my listeners, I gave them a week to watch a four-hour documentary. It's probably three hours and 45 minutes or whatever the total length. But, but, um, but they've had a week. So a lot of people listening to this have watched it now. And but I'm just curious, yes, that that explain though, because they're thinking the same thing. How did you get away with saying these things? How did this get made? You, you know, it's it's an addition. It's an addition of several circumstances. Uh, one being, uh, and that, that's also the result of very personal relationship uh, that I had. Uh, you know, we tend to see the studios or uh, you know, or, or Hollywood like Big Brother, you know, yeah. but it, it doesn't uh, uh, say everything. You know, you have to find allies. You have to find moment where the machine uh, is eventually weaker or when uh, the, the powers don't look at whatever you're doing or they don't even know you exist, you know, and we live such a time right now, you know, there is an extraordinary uh, uh, avalanche of money uh, right now on the field. You know, yeah. they are all trying to get as much, uh, 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 you know, client as possible. You know, it's a it's a global competition. You know, and by the way, uh, American companies only. So uh, my story start a little bit before. Uh, after I am not your Negro, you know, uh, usually uh, everybody invite you to to have a word, ask you, you know, what will be your, your next project? You know, basically it's a business and uh, they see that the film uh, did uh, make money. So uh, it's part of the business to, to you know, to invite right. you. And It was nominated for an Academy Award, so that's exactly. very attractive, yes. And, and we did very well uh, theatrically as well. So, uh, but then in those meetings, you know, there were people have, you know, because I'm old enough now and I've been... Uh, you know, I survived uh, so many years in this industry. 
So I, I grew up with certain people, and and one of them was the former president of HBO, uh, with whom I did this incredible film that that was also for me one of the film I I, I like so so much is sometimes in April about the genocide in Rwanda, and and at the time uh, the communication uh, uh, director of HBO was uh, you know Richard Pepler. You know, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. and and we did a lot of great jobs in making this film available to a wider audience. And I remember uh, he was key to allow the film to be seen. Uh, you know, they gave it to PBS for a national airing. You know, so that as much people as possible could watch the film. So uh, out of that, you know. Uh, you know, develop a, a sort of uh, friendship. You know, we, we used to email each other over the years. And so Richard was one of the people I, I met uh, after I Am Not Your Negro. And, uh, and you know, he started by uh, almost cursing me for 10 minutes, saying, how come you didn't do it by with HBO? You know, that I mean, why, should why have did, come why, to us. You know? Why didn't you do I Am Not Your Negro and, with HBO? Exactly. But yeah. <laughs> I said, you know, Richard, yeah, you know how the system is. And I needed my, my total freedom to make that film. You know, I, I needed to produce it myself. I needed to have the time necessary to find uh, 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 the film. Uh, it was not, uh, uh, you know, a, a product. It was a film that I knew I couldn't miss. It had to be the greatest film about Baldwin, and it had to be Baldwin, you know, in essence. So uh, I needed the time to find out, you know, and, and it, I told you before, it took me 10 years to make So. I, I could, would never, you know, and no studio would have accept you working on a, on a project for 10 years. So, so of course, he understood. And, and then he asked me, so what's next? And, and I told him and, and I was really truthful. I say, you know what? I'm, I'm very tired. I'm exhausted. And I went throughout the world with the film and I'm, I'm thinking about something to do. But uh, what I need is really time, some money to, to develop, uh, to pay some uh, a researcher to, to do some research for me, uh, but mostly time and, and, and freedom. And his response was, well, you can have all that. Mm. And that was it. Wow. Once we had decided that, you know, he gave uh, the necessary, uh, uh, you know, order that for the contract, etc. And by the time, uh, you know, within a month or two, I had a three year deal with HBO. And, and then the, the book, uh, Sven Linkwitz's book, uh, um, uh, got my attention. Uh, and I knew, okay, there is something there to, 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 uh, that could make an incredible film because it, it really connects to everything I've been working on for the last 40 years. You know? and, uh, and the thing is, during that time, you know, this famous merger between AT&T and... Um, uh, you know, HBO. Well, this big merger that took two years to, to, to be negotiated because Donald Trump didn't want uh, this merger because it was, you know... Right, CNN the merger between the, Time uh, Warner and, Time and, Warner, uh, exactly. Time and, uh, and uh, AT&T, right. And so Richard left uh, when the, uh, the merger was uh, finally accepted. Uh, uh, but the film was already uh, on, on rails. So, in fact, nobody was really... Uh, involved really in that film beside uh, uh, Richard and two, three more people who also are people I, I, I really trust and who trusted me. And, and it was like, uh, like a sort of Raoul's project and let Raoul do. So the whole network basically, you know, even protected me, you know, mm. and, and let me work. And so they no, did no interference. See, uh, you know, no interference. And they, they, mm -hmm. and they saw the film much, much later. I was already into a second and third draft uh, uh, edit. So it's, it's really a, a t total exception, you know, uh, that never happened before and will probably never happen again. Yeah, I was going to say that once AT&T, uh, which then be, had become the owners of HBO, saw your final cut, can you tell us what happened well, then? Well, you know, the, the, the thing is, when you do that, you know, you better come up with, with a, a great film, you know? Yeah. Because at the end of the day, you know, they, 
you know, censorship is not the first thing that comes to their head. What comes to their head? Will, will people watch the film? Or yeah. is it a great film? You know, yeah. That's the first question that needed to be answered. You know, I'm sh pretty sure if I had done something that was totally unwatchable, uh, that people would not understand, that was, you know, uh, um, for, for Chris' sake, they, they did the, the Michael Jackson film. You know, oh, they right, did right. Uh, Woody. I mean, those films for me sometimes are scandalous. You know, uh, so it, it's not what I say. Of course, is politically uh, uh, more radical, of course, but uh, I don't think the studio sometimes they they are in the business of making stuff that can be seen. You know, they they want success, and once in a while, of course, uh, you know, film like mine's. Uh, justify the fact that well the system is just you know the system uh, you know when you come up with something great they, they, you know you will be able to do it but the the fact of the matter is that uh, I really did have the the freedom and uh, nobody was watching over my shoulder all the time and 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 I was producing as well and and I had a great uh, staff uh, and people at HBO also. Uh, there are people who know, really know documentaries, uh, who really uh, uh, did their homework. And again, I was not uh, coming with something totally crazy. You know, it was, by the way, we had people doing, uh, you know, fact checking all the time. You know, and HBO did its own fact checking. So it, it's not like uh, there is a risk to, to, to do something that is totally unacceptable. It's just history. You know, that's the crazy thing, you know. I'm not revealing anything new. It's right. just the way I put it together that makes it lethal, you know. Uh, it, it's not, if you take every other piece, and that's one of the uh, problems we face today with so many, you know, internet device, with so many screens everywhere, With is that history is pieces in little bits and each part of the population or each genre or each uh, political party or even there is a tri tribalization of opinion right so everybody's going to take their piece and and and, and run with it what the, right. this film does is to connect the dots you know it's like you're you're creating a bomb and you're linking all the threads to make it explode. That's mm. what I did. Wow, that's a good way to put it because that is how it feels when you're watching this and you're sort of on the edge of your seat uh, with this. You also weave in, though, like you said, your own personal story and your family story. Anybody watching this, it's very clear, obviously, as you say, this, uh, I'm speaking to you, I'm a black man on this planet. And I am, I and and the the whole as you mentioned the Haitian Revolution, how it's completely no American kid is taught about the Haitian Revolution uh, while growing up, and when we talk about the great revolutions of the late eighteenth century, the American Revolution, the French Revolution, there's always the third revolution that's left out that had such amazing impact in terms of a country that was essentially an, a slave state, complete slave state. And that rose up, rose up against the Europeans, and and, and, and changed the history of the United States as well for the United because States. We, yes, without without the the you know uh, the the fight against Napoleon and without the uh, that Napoleon losing his whole army in Haiti, you know that's why he had to sell the Louisiana Purchase. You know, he had to sell all the French properties in on the continent. And, and by selling this to, to Jefferson, uh, they basically doubled the power of the 13 uh, states that existed before. Right. right. And so they were enabled to conquer further territories of, you know, Indian territories, basically, and continue until they, they had annihilated the whole country and take it over. So th this moment of the Haitian Revolution, which also enabled the rest of Latin America to free itself from colonization. Because that's the same. 
you you have to imagine there are only two countries that are independent on the whole continent north and south the first one is the united states of america the 13th state and the other one is the republic of haiti okay mm. and everything else is colonized and so haiti became the equivalent of cuba in the 50s you know most revolutionary became a uh, friend of Haiti. S Simon Bolivar came twice to Haiti to get weapons, men, money. Basically, the Haitian leadership uh, uh, choose between Bolivar and uh, this other one I'm forgetting, who are both fighting for the independence of their countries, uh, uh, basically Venezuela. And right. the Haitians told them, you know, you, you better, you know, unite. Because that's the only way you're going to win, you know. And, and that's what happened. And so you saw over the, the next decades, every single country in Latin America becoming independent. So that's the influence of the Haitian Revolution. You know? It exploded the whole continent. In the new country of the United States, seeing this revolution that I began, I think it began in 1790, the Haitian Revolution. Yes. That's so okay. Yes. So George Washington is elected the year before that. Okay. Yeah. So in other words, uh, the Haitian Revolution happens at the beginning of this country as a legal nation, but the fear of God that the Haitian Revolution put into the people in the United States, especially the masters, the owners, uh, they were so frightened. What oh, if the slaves? Terrifying. What if the slaves? Terrifying rose up and as they were as slave uprisings and rebellions began and started and continued um it was it was the used as the as the primary foundation for the creation of laws uh against people who were black uh and that and the, even the if you read the history of like we were all talking about defunding the police or the whatever with the police in the past year well Read the history of the police in the United States. Before there was even a police department, which was in New York City in 1845, the first 70, 80 years of this country, when we didn't have police forces, what we had were these slaves. It was slave, the militia. It was the militia and the slave patrols. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, exactly. and the Congress passing a law saying that these, that these slave, armed slave patrols could enter the northern non-slave states to, to find, capture, and return people who had essentially made their way to freedom. And um, if you go back and read the press at that time in the United States, late 1700s, early 1800s, um, Haiti is mentioned continuously. And it was, I am certain, an inspiration to the slaves you, you know, you, in the you United States. You must realize uh, the last days of the revolution in Haiti, uh, when the, the Napoleon's army was totally annihilated. It was like the last, you remember those last helicopter leaving Saigon, those images? Yes. yes. It was exactly like this. French people, uh, colonizers, uh, soldiers, remaining officers, you know, you had officers hiding as women, trying to take the last ship. And imagine those ships arriving in, in, uh, 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 in Philadelphia, in Atlanta, in all those, uh, you know, cost, uh, 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 cities yeah. with people, you know, some of them uh, totally wounded. Uh, uh, some of them had brought some of their slaves with them. That vision, you know, was terrifying. You know? And if you read the, the, the press of that, yes, you know, it was like, oh, my God, what, what happened there? You know, the world is totally changing. And what happened if it happened here as well on the continent? You know? So that's, and, and of course, Haiti was totally boycotted, boycotted uh, both by, by the United States, of course, who recognized Haiti uh, almost uh, 60 years later. You know, 60 years later. Mm. France took uh, at least 30, 30 years, 35 years. And after Haiti has to pay a ransom, mm -hmm. you know, supposedly to reimburse 
the colonizers for what they have lost. And, and of course, as usual, you know, you don't reimburse the slaves for their unpaid labor. You know? Of course not. And, and Haiti had, no, you know, the things that what happened in those days, you know, if you had ships and cannon, you know, that's also a storyline in the series, you know, the evolution of armament throughout the ages. In that time, most cities were on the coast, you know, because that's the way, the best way to, to uh, transfer merchandise. And so it was enough that uh, a German ship or an American ship or a French ship or a Spanish uh, ship comes in the bay and say, you know, if you don't deliver so and so much money, we will bomb you, you know. And, and a, a, a small and newly independent Haiti didn't have the means to, to resist. They could fight, uh, you know, against soldiers on the ground. But, you know, beside a few ships, they, they had no, uh, 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 you know, no way they could uh, fight an armada uh, trying to, to ransom them. So uh, basically, the president of Haiti of that time, you know, uh, had to negotiate with France. And, uh, and we paid around 28 billions of today's dollars to France. Mm. And, and you know the, the craziest thing, because people sometimes ask, you know, why is Haiti so poor? You know, well, it's so poor because we had to pay and they strangled us uh, economically. They mm -hmm. didn't want this nation to become a, a, re a real republic and right. economical viable. Uh, and you know, when we finished paying that, around the second half of the of 1950s around 1957 to basically new york city bank that's when haiti finished paying that debt wow wow because you know how it happened you know france wanted you know uh, the money in i think it was two or three uh, uh, parts but what you do as a country you borrow the money from banks and one of the banks that had the last money to be, to be reimbursed uh, uh, of was the the uh, National City Bank in New York, and we finished paying around 1957 after Second World War. Can you imagine? Yeah, after tens of thousands of people gave their lives to liberate France from the Nazis. Oh, by the way, uh, now we want <laughs> yeah, we want Haiti. To go broke again to pay back France for what? For you know, it should be the other way around. Yeah. The the reparations that were owed to the descendants of these slaves. Let me let me ask you this. So so you divided the film up into four chapters, as I call it, uh, four parts, and and each part has its own title. I'd like to start with the first chapter, part one, and it's called you call it the disturbing confidence of ignorance uh, ex explain both what that means and and what this first section of the film as as far as the title is concerned what i was referring to is this lack of or this arrogance of people who have been teaching us for so many hundred years uh, who we were supposed to be uh, what was the way the world needs to be uh, uh, to be uh, uh, ruled um, and saying, you know, talking about the superiority of race. And in fact, you realize that they don't even know their own history. You know, it's not only that some of them hide that part of history, but we are dealing with real ignorance. You know, uh, look at uh, the recent example uh, and, and maybe that's a question you can answer, you know, when Rick Santoro can say there was nothing when we came here, you know, and he's a former presidential candidate. And you basically say, and that's why I use the word ignorance, you basically say that the 100 million Native Americans who lived in north and south of the continent did not exist. You know, if hundred million of people live on this territory, 
That means they were nations. They had their own system of government, their own culture. They have, of course, they had war sometimes among each other, but they, they were the, 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 the real inhabitant of the whole territory. So you come there and then pretend a, a few hundred years later that there was, there was nobody. Well, then you have to explain. How do we come from 100 million to nobody? Because what happened is within a hundred years, 90% of them were, were, were dead. So right. it's either you tell me that story too, then I can understand your expectation or your hope of a dream. You know, you know this famous you know, dream country, which is America. You know? And uh, so it can only be a dream if you put everything on the table. You know? We cannot hide anything anymore. And uh, whether it's about the Native American uh, uh, genocide, whether it is about slavery, you know, as in the film, you know, uh, slave bodies, human bodies were used as collateral. You could go to a bank and say, I own one, two, five, 100 slaves. And with that, I want to borrow money. And the bank would give you the money. Mm. You know, that's that's yeah. reality. That's not a game. That's people's life. So for me, that kind of ignorance is is borderline criminal. You know, in fact, that's a that's a phrase of Baldwin. You know, he calls it. This is criminal. It's not ignorance yeah. anymore. It's not no. ignorance. No, because when so you, that, when that's you... the, the, the story behind that particular title and the first episode was important too because it, it was important to touch this idea of the dream. You know, The dream, in fact, that every single U.S. president talks about in his first speech when he, 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 he gets to the presidency. But it's, as you say, it's all based on a lie. The lie begins when we're in fifth grade reading on our history book that Columbus discovered America. And as you just said, discovered what? Like, like all of a sudden he just landed and there was just this empty. <laughs> you know, piece that's of why you, 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 you have seen this, uh, the, this joke at the beginning of episode four, you know, a, a guy walk, uh, walk into a bar, yeah. you know, and say, well, I, I own that bar now and I'm going to call it Hispaniola Lounge. You know? mm -hmm. And and all the patron are w looking at the guy. And said, "What the heck? You know, who are you? You know." And that's exactly what happened. You know, some guys come in your living room and say, "You know what? This is mine now." Right. I mean, it's it's an, it's incredible if you try. You know, uh, and that's the scene we we also have at the beginning of of uh, episode two, where we we shot it in the way from the point of view of the native. You know, seeing those guys coming in a big boat. Oh, that's a great shot. Coming yeah. to, to the shore. Before you had Columbus, you had many others. We had the, the Vikings. Who, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so, so I think that that occurrence uh, happened a few times, you know. And, and by the way, in the film, I don't uh, specifically identify uh, Christopher Columbus. Uh, in that, you know, for me, it's just they, they used to, to see that. As the viewer of the film, though, I'm sitting there going, okay, <laughs> <laughs> you guys, put the word out. Trouble. Trouble is coming ashore. <laughs> Stop this now. This isn't going to end well. Yeah, but, but even that, I, I, I'm not even... You, you remember this, this uh, incredible story of this young pastor who wanted to go on an island where people live that have never seen uh, uh, the modern world. You know, and then he was killed on the beach, on the uh, you know yeah. uh, arriving. You you remember those images? Yeah. There are a few images of them. You know, and if you put yourself in the place of those people, you know, you know a any nation, any human being, any village f really think he's or they are the center of the world. That's how we are. You know, so I try to be in that place of minds 
Because when you see, uh, as you say, well, there come danger, they have no clue that it's danger. Because you, you are the center of the world. You're basically watching somebody coming to your house. Right. You know, you don't know yet that it's going to be end up. You know, that's right. why they, they, they help those people. They gave them food most right. of the time. They help them. You know, uh, Roxanne Domba Ortiz was, was one of the people who explained that also to me, the way, you know, to come, if you had come really on a totally unhabited land, you would have died because you didn't know how to cultivate. You didn't know, you know, that means uh, the forest would be totally wild. There would be no roads. You would have to build your own roads, et cetera, et cetera. But that nature was already controlled by the Native American. They had already, uh, they were already in communion with that world. Right. They had, world. they had their own infrastructure. Yes. So they, without that help, no pilgrim could have stayed. You know, right, they would right. have not have survived. They were not equipped for it. So your your second chapter uh, is entitled "Who the fuck is Columbus?" Th well, that's exactly that what, what we were speaking. You know, it's like yes, uh, where where did you get that idea that this land is yours? You know, we have been living here for centuries. You know, and so so. It, it's something I try to do in every single episode is, is always to go back to the core story and to uh, uh, reverse the kind of almost psychological way of seeing history, you know, because that's what Eurocentric uh, 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 history and, and mindset does to you. It imposes itself as the center of everything. So whoever is the other is had either a savage or somebody you will educate or somebody you will civilize. But for sure, we are the center of the world. And, and the, the whole film perspective is from the other side. I, I definitely put myself from, on the other side. And, and the way I filmed everything, the way I filmed the, the scripted part, if you, you watch where the camera is placed, it's never from the point of view of the Spanish uh, invaders. It's always from, from the point of view of the, of the natives. And this is something I try to do constantly uh, uh, throughout the whole film, you know, to establish what is the perspective, who is watching, who is in the interior, who is the exterior. You know? Because it, it's... Th that knowledge or that, uh, you know, that uh, propaganda or that uh, the way we were educated, all of us, you know, is so deep that we don't even think about it anymore. You know, we take it as natural to see the world the way it is. You know? uh, and, and, you know, it's a, having traveled throughout the world, you know, it's a feeling that is very strange. I you know, to, to feel somewhere else and you, you definitely feel it's not your country or you're not, your view of the world or your view of human being is not uh, the one of these people. You know, I remember going to Australia, you know, and even watching the news or watching the weather uh, uh, channel, suddenly the map that you're watching is, is Australia, basically, and a little bit of Japan and New Zealand, etc. But you don't see Europe, you don't see Africa, you don't see America. But if you live on this side of the world, that's you know that's the only see only thing you see, and it's it's a very strange feeling to say, oh my God, this is that I have been totally wrong because somebody who grew up in Australia, this is his world, and this is the center of the world. Mm -hmm. He right. doesn't need permission of the U.S. He doesn't need permission of Britain for anything. This is his world. And of course, uh, they did their own colonization against the native in Australia as well. You know, but it, it is interesting. You know how to cross different perspective and and how to push the center to to the exterior and 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 totally reframe everything, reframe the storytelling. 
I was watching a documentary on the Black Panthers that Anya Sparta did back in 1968. It was on, for some reason, on TV this week. And she points out, and the Black Panthers point out, uh, they keep they do not refer to where they live in Oakland or Detroit or whatever as the inner city or the ghetto uh, or whatever. It, they refer to it as the colonies. That they are they are living in Amer- American colonies. They've been coloni- colonized, and um, it was it was very powerful to hear this perspective from 1968. And sad to think of how that essentially is what is still going on. But we've we've gussied it up with nicer terms and names and and. Yeah, but uh, but there is something new happening, and I, and and that's an, an incredible moment for me each time when when somebody speak up in front of an audience and say, uh, I am speaking here from the ground of the nation of so-and-so, you know, to reclaim the name, to reclaim the ground this way, even if it is symbolic, it's important. No, I know if any film festival I go to now, they always make it a point to begin each film saying, we are using the land of and and the the name of the of the tribe exactly that's incredibly important yes know? and it's, and you know trio said in, in his book you know naming is power yeah that's real you know and and that's why you know changing the name sometimes and and at least reflect on the names why is this name here you know what was there before because i just came afterwards you know who was there before me you know mm. that's the the the, the minimum uh, uh, we can do you talk about the bright colors of fascism and the importance that fascism plays for especially for white society to maintain control uh, talk a little bit about that um the, the fourth episode about, you know, it, it was a, a way for me to reconnect about today's fight. And today's fight everywhere. Uh, not only in America, not only in Germany, not on, it's everywhere. You know, you can see uh, we are living um, a sort of decadence of the Western gaze, of, of the Western powerful machine. Uh, and it's capitalism in a huge global transformation, you know. And that's why some people are scared, you know. They are scared because they feel that something is changing. They don't know what is it, but they feel threatened, you know. And, and, and you feel through the violence that it, it creates, you feel how threatened they feel. And, and so many other voices are, are being heard. So it's confusing for a lot of people who most of their life didn't have to question anything. You know? uh, that, that's, I have a sentence in the film that says, uh, superiority makes you fragile. You know? That's exactly what I mean with it. Mm. You know? The fact that you have been, you, didn't, you never had to think about right. makes you, in fact, fragile in a world that is transforming itself very, very fast. So then white supremacy, is it possible that ultimately it's not going to end well for the white supremacists? This is that ultimately that the people will rise up. They will not tolerate this behavior. Or is it if they have enough weapons and they have enough wherewithal and a, a lack of conscience and whatever... Um, they will. They will be the ones who well, reign supreme. Well, I, I have another way to look at it. Uh, you know, one thing we can uh, say that we are we have acquired is a sense of what we call, you know, for the lack of a better name, uh, democracy. Okay, and and we see that democracy can be used uh, different ways and and. And sometimes, uh, uh, you know, it has the name of democracy and it's a dictatorship. Uh, but still, let's agree that uh, theoretically in his form, it's a way for people to agree to something, you know. And uh, I, I can't make any pronostic, you know. Uh, 
know, what I see and learning from history is that first, civilization can disappear. That, that's a fact. Uh, throughout the, uh, you know, human history, throughout those uh, some 6,000, 7,000 years since human beings start creating nations and, and villages, uh, some civilization have disappeared within, you know, a few decades sometimes. Uh, so that's a fact. So we have to put it on the table. A second thing is, what, whatever the war is, whatever the, the struggle, whatever the number of people that you are killing, there is always a moment where you have to sit around a table and talk. You know, there is not just such a thing of total annihilation. You know, uh, there, there is very, uh, very few, and and uh, and uh, there have been ways of of you know. Uh, people uh, wanting revenge, people wanting to straighten up the, the history. So with those facts, for me, is the future is, is not written yet. Uh, I said we are in a transformation, but the ultimate result will depend on how far are we capable to create allies to uh, thank and to find solutions and to fight back. You know, it's a number of, of things that we need to make because it's not going to make to happen alone. You know, we are in this machine that we call capitalism, where there is there are no conductors, you know, it's basically free reigns. And now that capitalism is now basically financial and numerical, you can speculate with actually stuff that are not money, stuff that are not product, uh, and you can do that electronically today. So uh, this global offensive is going on. So the question is, are we human beings, nations, Democrats, are capable to stop that? And stopping it means uh, aggressively find solution, going on the streets, meeting together, create uh, uh, solutions. That's what, you know, when we look at the history of the working world, you know, everything we have today is the result of fight. You know, the unions, the, the, the uh, social security, uh, I'm <laughs> basically talking about Europe at least, you know, all those where the, the, the to, to be able to vote, you know, freedom of voting, etc. Those did, were not just given, you know. They had, you had to go on the street to fight for it, you know. Uh, the civil rights movement is uh, another perfect example, you know. Nobody handed civil rights law to us, you know. People died for it, you know. So the future is, is as well a, a, a matter of are we willing and are we capable to fight besides just sending tweets, because you don't make changes by tweeting alone. You know, you need boots on the ground, as the military says, you know. And it, and it takes time, you know. One extraordinary uh, lesson we can learn is what uh, Stacey Abraham and all her companions did in Georgia. People should learn from that, because that's the way to go. They took, you know, people think they see the result and think that it happened uh, uh, one day to the other. No, they have been mm. working on it for at least 10 years. It was 10 years of hard work, house per house, person per person. They had to convince people. They have to, to really educate. And they had to lose sometimes. And so that's the price we will have to pay that we need to pay if we really want changes. And, and so, unfortunately, uh, we, we lost that purpose. We lost that knowledge along the way. And, and the way we are so distracted today doesn't help much either. 20 to 30 million Americans in the streets last summer and fall was something that had never happened in this country before. And I think yeah. that my hope is 
as you say, these boots on the ground, when people realize we're not going to affect change simply by writing our member of Congress or tweeting or Facebook. Yeah. Um, but not that you shouldn't do those things. I mean, no, that's, you, that's good. But that, use that's all means. But that yeah, is not yeah. enough because this is a big fight. And I, I said after the election, especially after Georgia, I said, okay, everybody listening, we need a Stacey Abrams in every state. If that's yes. you, if that's you, in listen to it. In every street, in every neighborhood. In every street, every neighborhood. That's how they started. They started that's right. through neighborhoods. You know? That's right. And uh, if I may, uh, another great example that people will understand. You know, I remember very well the whole movement that elected uh, President Obama. Mm -hmm. Okay? I swear to God, I thought everybody would continue with that same level of organization once Obama is president. And in fact, that's not what happened. Right. Obama is elected, everybody went home. And right. so what is the, you know, I think people sometimes don't understand how democracy works, you know? Democracy has become a, a consumer good, you know? Uh, so you have it, you go to election, you elect some, somebody, and then you can go home. No, democracy is a fight of every day. So if right. we had managed to put 500,000 people in the streets every day in different corner of the Republic, then you put pressure on the whole system. You put pressure on, on, the, on the, uh, the senators, on the uh, elected officials, on everything. And then you entertain a discussion. You know, you exchange ideas. And then you don't have a president alone in the White House trying to negotiate everything. It's already a weekend, you know. And we have seen what happened with, with the healthcare reform, you know. And, and that's something we need to learn. You know, changes come because you are capable of organizing. That's the history of the country. That's how the country was capable to advance further and to defend their rights properly. You are very powerful when you say early on in the film, speaking of, of President Obama, um, you play a, a, a portion of an interview with him and he says, We sometimes make mistakes. We have not been perfect. But if you look at uh, the track record, as you say, uh, America was not born as a colonial power. Well, actually it was. America was born as a colonial power. And this fact is a difficult one to admit. For it bears the fatal capacity to disrupt the core story we have been told all these years and the very foundation of this country. It's not an easy story to tell, because the story still continues today. A story of the search for purity and for a godly kingdom. A story of survival and violence. A search for origin, 400 years after the voyage that is said to have made the nation. That was an important, yeah, yeah. That, and that's really uh, the core of everything else. That's the core of everything else. And wh while you were talking, I, I was thinking, you know, how do I say that to one of the guys or one of the women who were uh, in the Capitol uh, on six on June six? You know, do you think on, we can on have January six the, in the January insurrection 6th. on the, yeah yeah? Do you think we can have a conversation about that? Because it's it's about fact. You know, it's not about opinion. It's not about you know political position. It's just can we sit down and have that conversation? It's impossible. It's, it's impossible. impossible. Yeah. You know? And and that's that's why I say it's a lethal capacity to disrupt everything. Because most people do not want, there are people who don't know, who are willing to know, but there is a vast majority who can't even fathom or who can't even accept the beginning of the sentence of that. They they would explode, explode, you know. And um, yeah, but that's that's it, you know. And and Baldwin have said it uh, so many ways and so many times, you know. So how how do we deal with them? As long as we don't 
put that first and foremost, the elimination of the Native American. And second, slavery. We cannot talk of the American dream. Right. It's, 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 a, it's an impossibility. Or you want to say, well, let's push out all these people, you know, and let's make our own little colony. For like, like you know, uh, uh, just before the First World War, where you know the, the whole eugenics movement wanted to say, well, let's have a, a white Christian Gentile America. That was the plan. You know? So as long as you know, as Baldwin says, you know, as long as you know, you're talking about a dream, but as long as the survivors, Native American, and blacks are there. They will wreck your dream. You know, they will wreck it. You know? and, and that's the reality. So it's, it's almost a, a psychological case of denial. You know? And you are, the, the more you, you do not want to see, the more you're going to cling to that dream. Like right. a Nick Santorum did. You know? Because that's, it's like you have gone so far up and when you look back down, you're going to fall because you are so far out of the reality. And it's scary. You know? I, sometimes I understand the, 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 the violence of some of these guys because it's, it goes in their bellies. You know? it, it's, it's, it, uh, uh, how do you say? It's question who they are, who they think they are, who they have been told they are. You know, that's how radical the thought is, you know. And the only thing I can say to that is, you know, so from, from the side of a black person, you know, and, and I, I hope I speak with all the other black person, you know, or Native American, welcome to the band, you know, because that's what we have been going through all our life. They have been telling us we don't exist. Right. No, I know. It's and it's <sighs> white people see that video taken by the seventeen year old of George Floyd's murder. And I can't tell you how many times I've heard it was shocking. It was I'm I i can not believe I how and then, then if they're a little more enlightened, they'll go, How often does this happen? And I have said to people, my friends, uh, you know, if any, if anybody black was standing around us right now, they'd either be laughing or angry because they have been watching this. They didn't have video. They, Steve Jobs hadn't put a, a a camera in the phone yet, but they they have watched this since 1619 on these shores. This is this For, is forever, forever. forever. Yes, forever. And, and people of color go back to the Muslims of the Crusades. They have been witnesses to this. And and we act like we're just finding out about it in 2020. And I'm 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 like, okay, that's okay. Let's okay, now that you found out about it, now let's do the work. Uh, you know, I'm not gonna hold you to the fact that you didn't know about it for you know, the rest of your life, but you know now, so what are we all gonna do about it? And and what role do we play in this? How do we succeed? How do we organize? But, but you see how, uh, you know, the, the, the craziest thing is that uh, sometimes I look at some uh, white angry guy and, and you ask him why is he so angry? And he's angry just by something very little, you know, something he felt was taken away from him. I said, do you realize if black people will act like this, for everything they have been done to, you know, they would, you know, massacre everybody on this country. Yes, I, I you know? often I mean, thought. That, that's, I mean, that's a crazy, you know. No, if I would indulge in in my anger, this country would ne would would not stand for another day. You know, if all black people, all minorities, all and I would include women as well in it, you know. If women would say, you know what, as of today, I'm not willing to take anything from you guys, anything. 
no whistle in the streets no insult no looking at my back no you know anything you know that that would be crazy you know and i went to those guys you know because you you told them that uh, yeah yeah you know america is not great again you know and then they were you know they they would uh, they were ready to kill you you know we are at a very strange place right now and and the you know the title of of you know the 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 arrogance of ignorance is is so true for me and, and it's it's uh, devastating somehow when the michigan militia the white michigan militia showed up at the state capitol and then went into the building with all their guns armed armed and loaded and um nothing happened to them they shut down the legislators sort of ran out uh because they were frightened a couple days later uh some uh, black residents of the state of michigan decided to do the same thing and showed up at the capitol all armed can you imagine how that was portrayed the the, the two days before it was just militia guys who believe in the second amendment two days later black michiganders with guns was like oh my god they called in so many police yeah no well that's that's a wonder they were not shut down you know just coming out of the subway right right well what about what about as you said with women who are the majority gender by the way um and yet only have 25 percent of the elected representatives in our congress 75 percent are men who are the minority gender and the, what if the majority gender women showed up with semi-automatic weapons <laughs> on on the grounds of the Capitol? And said, so this is not democracy if the majority gender has only twenty five percent of the legislature. What would what would the be? I mean, well, of course, that would be a total freak out. But I'm just saying, I'm so glad you've raised this point because I've often wondered how lucky. And you know, remember in South Africa. Mandela's laid out of prison. The government decides they can't keep up the apartheid anymore. And and the fear of all this with white people, where the black South Africans were going to slit their throats and massacre them for the way they've been treated for, God yeah. knows, hundreds of years. And and yet that didn't happen. And nobody could believe it. Nobody could believe yeah. it. Because, and the reason why, they can't, why a white person can't believe it is because we know what we would do. If you yeah, oppressed exactly. us for that long... If you killed us and, and lynched us and did this to our children for this long, do you think you're going to get away with it? And yet, I just have just I marveled at it at the time in South Africa that the kindness and generosity that forming a commission of reconciliation yeah. with the former masters and rulers. It's it's but, but it, again, uh, Michael, that that's the, an interesting point. But you 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 know that it was the result of decades of organization. You know, you had a party that was well, the ANC at the time was incredibly well yes. uh, organized. And, Before and Mandela had, even went to prison. Yeah. Oh, and even from prison, you know, you had groups of people who were highly qualified, who were thinking, you know, how do we get out of there? And, and it was the result of negotiation. Uh, by the way, some of those uh, secret negotiations, we still don't know what 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 was the because uh, people were pushing as well. You know, the American was in it, and and many very wealthy uh, 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 sectors were in in that negotiation, and they came up with that, which is of course an incredible uh, uh, way to solve those uh, you know decade long uh, uh, abuse and 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 apartheid. And and uh, and uh, the commission was also a, a, a result of that. So it, it doesn't happen as a miracle, you know. It, yeah. It's always the result of, first of all, many people dying and many people organizing. Uh, people have been tortured. People have been killed, and they continue. And and Mandela is of course the symbol of all that, but. He didn't do it uh, alone, you know. Of course, it's, it's, it was really the result of of incredible participation at all levels, from the slums to the to people in the economy, people in culture, 
etc. And 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 they won that battle. You know? And we're not going to win unless we follow that example, and that it takes exactly. all of us. Not just and, and we can add the, the example of of Israel and Palestine. You know, there, there is no way to go without you know people on both sides sitting around the table. You know, and well, but right now, you know, with the extremists uh, in power in Israel, you know, it's there is no way that can, can come. You know, and you are pushing the Palestinian even more and and pushing to desperate uh, uh, reaction. You know, the the, the Hamas is a desperate response to 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 the absurdity of the of the situation. So it's easy today to say, well, they are launching rockets. Yeah, but. Where did it come from? You know, what do you say to a, a, a twelve-year-old, a fourteen-year-old that have grew up in a camp that he has no future, and he sees every day he goes when he goes to school. You know, when he has the, the to go through some sort of of roadblocks that he has to show his ID. That you know, it's like a, a police a surveillance. All the time in certain part of, of those territories, you know, and it's of course some sort of uh, 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 settler colonialism as well. That's uh, I, I recommend you, uh, by the way, uh, a book. Uh, I know you like to recommend your audience. Uh, there is a book that talks really about that and way better than I can do it. Uh, it's called uh, Neither Settler Nor Native. Uh, the making and unmaking of permanent minorities from Mahmoud Mandani, you know, who is a great Columbia University scholar and, and a great friend, by the way. And, and his, his book is really show you, showing you uh, how you know, different colonies dealt with that. He, deal, you know, he talks about the United States of America, he dealt about South Africa, and he deals also about Israel and, and Palestine, and it's incredible how you know the the, the he explained uh, the formation of these nations and what, what it implies for minority and how how they create minor, minorities, because mm. the Palestinians were created as minorities, which they were not before. Right. You have a very powerful moment near the end of the film, and you talk about this. 18-year-old Palestinian girl who strapped a bomb to herself and, and, and blew herself up a bus in Tel Aviv. And, and then you pause for a, a brief second and then you say, When others think about revenge, I think of my daughter. What would have pushed her to commit such a horrific act? Would I call my child a monster? Yes, it is complicated. When you personalize it like that, when you realize what would it take, what kind of living and suffering would it take for an 18-year-old girl to do this? If we are, have the courage to be willing to ask that question as you do, and it's kind of like, you know, it's you, you catch your breath in your throat when you say this in the film, because, I mean, me or anybody watching this, it's like, you instantly relate to this and then you instantly have to have some empathy for what's going on or we're never going to fix this. It's yeah. very powerful. And, and, and you know, the, the strange thing when I found that piece in, in the film, when I, I edited, um, I, I cried because I felt this is the core story because as long as we don't see the other, even the monster, we will not be better in living together. I have to take in account who is in front of me, who is the enemy, because I go from the fact that we are all human beings, we are one species. There is no nothing. The idea of race is totally uh, uh, non-scientific. It doesn't make sense. And, and by the way, this is something I learned also from, from Baldwin, you know. The power of Baldwin's words is because when he talked about conflict, when he talks about America, when he talks about the rest of the world, he always does it from a human point of view. 
He's profoundly a humanist. He's watching like he's in a laboratory and watching human beings moving and doing the worst thing uh, you can think of. And, and he still loved those people, you know? And, and uh, you know, he has another sentence that is some sort of a mantra for me when he says, you know, I, I've learned of loving every human being or every human being is a miracle. And I, I uh, you know, learn to love the miracle they, they are and at the same time to protect myself mm. from the monster they have become. Right, wow. You know, so and, and it said yeah. it all. It said it all. Yeah. And, yes. and, and that's what I felt when I, 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 I wrote that line because it's, and, and by the way, it's, it's a, a sentence I, I, I wrote in my journal many decades before. Mm. And I, 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 you know, I bumped onto it and I say, this is perfect for, for the film because mm. uh, it, it convey everything that I feel right now about the stupidity of conflict, the stupidity of people killing other people just because they think they don't exist or they are inferior. You know, that's, that's you know, it doesn't make sense if you call yourself a human being, you know. We, we are capable of doing so, so much harm, so much, you know, uh, massacre that, uh, that, that it's, it's mind-blowing, you know. And, uh, and so that, that was important for me that I, I, at least I, I can mention that conflict, which is another film for itself, you know, and, yes. and I hope I one day I can, I can deal with that part. And, and by the way, last thing about that, <laughs> Baldwin also wrote an incredible piece on Jerusalem. I, you should find it. I, I don't remember the title, but it's something like a letter from Jerusalem. Mm. It's a small essay, maybe a page or two. And believe me or not, he wrote it like 50 years ago, but is as if he wrote it like today. Mm. I, I'll this look that up. This guy could see through reality in a way that none of us can. Yeah. Well, I think you have done a incredible job. You've made another masterpiece looking at these things. And it's it's the way you have woven it all together. You know, when I started to say that this was in chapters, my friends, it's not. this is not your typical documentary, chapter one, and then it goes in some chronological order. Uh, uh, Raul goes back and forth and forth and back so that we can understand how we got here and understand what's ahead of us if we truly want to change. And, and, and I got to say, as a documentary filmmaker, you, use, you do reenactments in this, which I think are brilliant. And you have yeah. a device that I, at first it was like, wow, what is he doing? And then I started laughing and laughing in a good way, like, oh, this is brilliant. So if I could just share this with the audience before we close, uh, the, the actor Josh Hartnett, uh, I'm sure people know uh, who he is, uh, wonderful actor. And um, so you, in these reenactments that go all the way back to the Crusades, through the slave trade, through uh, the, the uh, war to annihilate uh, uh, the Native Americans, um, and... And throughout this, throughout this thousand-year history, when you need to have a white man do what the white man did at the time, there's actor Josh Hartnett, <laughs> and and he is he becomes the universal white man through the ages. And I just thought this was such a genius way to to do do this instead of trying to. I I've seen the other ways people try to do this, but this was just no. This is. This is not, not this is not my token white man. This is the universal white man, and and you got him to agree to play all these roles through the centuries, and it's just genius. Just give me a little bit of, of what your thinking was about that. <laughs> well, that's exactly the type of thing that would develop while I was uh, writing the, the film because I knew that I had to go further than I did uh, with I am not your Negro, and. And because I'm basically dealing with a history with images that I don't have, because nobody did those images from right. my point of view. So I had to invent them. 
And so uh, my sentence is, you know, whatever means necessary. So sc scripted part, and, and you call them reenactment. I, I call them, for me, they are totally autonomous stories. You know? Yes. They, yes. I'm it's not reenacting it. It's a better way to put it. Yes. It's, it's, it's I, I'm creating a parallel narrative in order to catch you at another level, a more emotional level, and turn you around. Because I wanted through that device to get you into feelings that you've never felt before. And in particular, uh, the white audience, but also the black audience, because we are also sometimes uh, uh, totally uh, 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 brainwashed by Hollywood, you know? And, right. and so it was important to have that freedom and to have that device to go as far as possible in generating emotions that, that you have never gone through. You know? mm. and, and Josh Hartnett, and by the way, again, it's, it's the whole story of this film is, is a miracle in that sense too, and, and it's organic. Nothing that happened there uh, Everything on the country, everything that happened there in the film is organic. It's part of the story. That's why I tell the story of Roxanne. I tell the story of Sven Linquist. I tell also the story of my friendship with uh, uh, Michel Wolf to you. And my story with Josh is I needed an American actor. And I needed an actor that have not really play the usual suspect to play the bad guy because right. I didn't want a bad guy. I didn't want, I wanted a guy that any American would recognize as the genuine American hero. Yes. You know, it's David Crockett, basically. And, mm. and I had to show him as a real human being, you know, and because otherwise you won't understand his dramatic curve. Because basically what am I showing is a mercenary, a cold killer. And at the beginning of the film, when he, he kills this seminal uh, 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 chieftain, you know, he's, he's tired. He's tired of having killed hundreds and hundreds of people. You know, and every day. And he's exhausted. And then you follow him throughout history. And throughout those four episodes, at some point he realized the job that he was asked to do. Because he's a human being, you know. I have, you know, in any of my film, I never show like a, a bad guy. For me, is a human being that does very bad things. And I need to understand why. What is his motivation? in what system he is, what is, this, what is the context. And I want to see his eyes, you know. He has, he's looking at the victims because he ha he's taking a, de a decision. You know, it's unlike Western. You know, in Western, you can kill left and right, upside down, everywhere. You don't need to know the identity. You, it's just, you know, the hero is killing everybody. And that's not the kind of film I make. Killing somebody is something grave. It's something very uh, uh, important. And personal. And I want to see the, the, the eye of the killer. Yeah. And at what right. point does he take the decision? I mean, uh, uh, what you did with Columbine, that's exactly that. So you go inside the, the, the head of that person. You know? yeah. So I needed that character. And what happened is that toward the end, his head is exploding. There are too many dead people. He's carrying too many uh, a ghost in his soul, and there is no way out. Exactly, and and uh, and you watch this, and you think, you think, you know, fellow fellow white people, we're committing the same suicide. Well, it doesn't well, have exactly. to. It doesn't point, have to end this yes. way. It doesn't have if, to end this way. If you go uh, until the end, it's going to be suicide for everybody. It doesn't end well. Exactly. Well, listen, this has been an incredible conversation. I um, really want to encourage people listening to this 
to go if you have HBO, HBO Max. Uh, or what are the other ways that people can see Exterminate All the Brutes? Right now, I, I can't tell you. I know it, we are on different uh, uh, um, uh, platforms. Oh, right. You're, uh, you're in it's France. It's on Sky right. as well in, in Britain. It's on Sky. It's, it's uh, open in, in Great Britain on Sky. Uh, but what is for sure, I'm working uh, uh, with HBO right now. I'm trying to convince them uh, to give the film to PBS for a certain numbers of, of screening, whether mm -hmm. it's one, two, or a whole week. But because that's what they did with sometimes in April, you know, they did, right. they did a, a big, well, I, I hope, I hope know, they do that. I hope they do PBS. that. Yes. If, if people want to watch it tonight, uh, you can always, and you don't have HBO, you know, you can sign up for a 30 day free trial and exactly. It'll give you the chance to watch this film, and you can decide later if you want to stay on. If you don't want to stay on, it hasn't cost you anything. Uh, just, you know, don't miss this movie. Exterminate all the brutes. And it's been such uh, an incredible thing for me to experience viscerally, and it has inspired me in ways that someday I'll talk about in terms of what I went on to do next. But I thank you for that gift. Uh, Raul, and I thank you for these films. Again, everyone, I am not your Negro, and the fiction films, the young Karl Marx, and others, uh, and and Raul's documentaries on Haiti. So much good stuff here to check out. And I know it's late now in France, and you've stayed up uh, to do this, so I'm greatly appreciate it. And please keep doing more of this. Uh, it was a pleasure, Michael. Really, it was. I, I enjoy um, having that discussion with you and. And I think we, we should have that more often, uh, not on the air, of course, but uh, yes. and no, uh, no. maybe we can find a few things to, to do together. Because, I uh, yes, well, that's exactly time, what I was, I was thinking. <laughs> the time is yeah, now. The time is there now. is no more time to waste. And I look exactly. forward to speaking with you and doing that uh, with you, Raul. Um, it, it would mean the world to me, and I think people will be helped and be appreciative. And remember, folks, as I've often told you with my films, um, it's not just the political issues here. It's that we're also filmmakers. We're artists. We're creative people. And we are making films uh, for you to enjoy. Enjoy, if that's the right word. But yes, enjoy as movies. Uh, when you see the cinematography of Raul's film, this is the brilliant way that he captures his these travels around the world. I can't begin to describe. You'll know exactly what I'm talking about in the first 10 minutes of this movie. Um, but uh, we make them as movies so that we can bring the things that we'd like to say and the stories we'd like to tell to the rest of you. But we, but we are not making medicine for you. We are not, you know, wagging our finger. You must take your medicine. It's not that, folks. When you and hear, we are not <laughs> making product for your. It's not product either. That is correct. That is absolutely correct. So, so um, do me the honor, do Raul the honor, and do yourself a wonderful favor, especially if it's on this holiday weekend. Uh, you, you've got till Tuesday morning, folks. Uh, 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 watch this movie, um, and and write to me about it here. My address is on the on the podcast page, or leave me a voicemail. There's a voicemail. My voicemail is on there. You can it leave it let you leave a one minute voicemail. I'd love to hear what you think of exterminate all the brutes. Raul, many thanks. Much gratitude. Thank you, uh, Michael. Thank you. It was great. Please keep doing it, and I I look forward to that moment when we get to work together. Yes, we will do. Be well. Be safe. And all of you who are listening, um, thank you to our executive producer Basil Hamden our editor and, and sound engineer, uh, Nick Quaz, and um, uh, to everybody who has supported this podcast, including our underwriters, thank you so much for letting my voice and the voice of Raul and all my guests to be heard, not only in, in this country, but around the world. Um, it means a great deal uh, to me. Uh, enjoy the holiday. Uh, this is Michael Moore, and this is... Rumble. Knock, knock, knocking on the heaven's door. Hip hop to freaky tie and big hair. 
knock, knock, knocking on the heavens door. I tell the princess.